my name is Tim Hornet, and I am fortunate enough to be one of the volunteers at the uh, Maritime Society here. And I've been given the uh, job of custodian of the historic Sudbury workboat. The, uh, the work boat is one of several boats that we have restored and are in the process of restoring over the years. And it's really a matter of keeping these historic vessels around as long as we can. We have a lot of very skilled craftsmen who fortunately can still do the uh, boat building work. But those are getting harder to find these days. It doesn't seem to be the same apprenticeship kind of thing that uh, used to be the case, but uh, anyway we are happily restoring boats. We've now got four running vessels on the water and we have several more that are in the shop ready to come. I've only been appointed custodian the last couple of, couple of years. So most of the work on the boat was done by other volunteers before I came along. But the, uh, the boat itself was built in 1941 and is the work boat for the, uh, the big Sudbury Marine uh, salvage tug. And there's a huge history on that boat. But when we got this particular work boat, it had fallen into a pretty poor state. Originally it had a tiny cabin on it been converted to a little sort of cabin cruiser that was removed so we had to replace a lot of the uh, the planks and the hull and several of the ribs as well to get it back to a seaworthy condition this is the Subri's little engine it's a single cylinder Volvo diesel MD1B of 1950s vintage or thereabouts so this replaced the original gas engine, which was unfortunately destroyed. But it's quite enough power to push this little guy along. We had it up to about mm, nearly six knots at the weekend, which is about as fast as it will go. It's not the quietest engine, I have to say, and it does give you a fair bit of vibration. But uh, she's fun, and uh, we'll see if we can get her going for you. So this motor is a single cylinder diesel and has a decompressor lever here. But when you lift that up, it keeps the exhaust valve open a little bit. So it enables you to spin the engine, and then you drop that and it fires. At least that's the plan. And this particular engine has got a, a starter, which is also a dynamo. So the dynamo is fed with battery current, and it turns the dynamo, instead of generating power, it uses power. That's quite an unusual arrangement. So let's see if we can get it going. So we give it a little bit of throttle. And then there's a little thing here that you have to push in, which is a cold start. All right, so let's give her a go here. So the batteries are on. Spin her over. So the restoration shop at LMS added this uh, gunnel to the boat 
all the way around. This is all rot, rotten previously. And replaced quite a few of the ribs and the, uh, and the planks. But now she's in great shape and it's dry. It takes on very little water, as long as we keep it in the water. But no, she's a fun little boat and actually goes along very well once the engine's running reliably. And hopefully we can take people out. It's about 19 foot altogether and about oh, five foot wide. The uh, original purpose of this was to act as a, a small tender for the large tug. And so it's, uh, it's a fairly heavy boat for its size and its use was pulling lines and supplies and things from the, the mother ship to whatever ship they were working on or towing. So it was a very important little, little, little ship to, uh, to help the tug operations. We got it in, in 2004 and it was donated and as I say it was a fairly derelict condition at the time. And many of the boats we have had have been donated on, on, you know, on the condition that we restore them and look after them. And so this is another example of that. As I mentioned, the, uh, the workboat was part of the original Sudbury deep sea tug. And that was originally built as a corvette for the Canadian Navy. And the uh, corvette, after the war, became war surplus and we had an entrepreneur, um, Harold Elworthy, who decided he would buy this old Corvette and make it into the best salvage tug you could get. And that was in 1954. So he did and he spent a great deal of money. I believe it was at least $100,000 back then, which is a, a vast fortune. Goodness knows what it would be now. But he completely stripped the boat out and installed new engines and a lot of the state-of-the-art salvage gear that you could get, equipped it with large fuel tanks, and made it ready to go anywhere in the world. It had about a 4,000 mile range, which was exceptional for those days. And then he basically just waited for a job. So he spent all of this money. He owned uh, Island Tug and and barge limited at the time. So he had a number of other vessels, but this was the flagship. And nothing happened for many years. He kept it in steam in Victoria, ready to go at any moment with a standby crew. And he was just spending a fortune. And people thought, this guy's crazy, what's he doing? But eventually he did get his big break. And that was in 1955, when there was a distress call from the Greek freighter Macedonia. And that, that had lost its propulsion way out in the North Pacific and was drifting uncontrollably. So Elworthy got his crew together and they set off to rescue this ship. And the deal was that if they actually got it back to port, they would get half the salvage value of the vessel. And at the time that was about $300,000, so that was worth doing. If they didn't make it, they got nothing at all. Actually, Elworthy wasn't on the boat. He had a, a skipper whose name was Captain Blackball, and he put his crew together, and they had the, the best crew in, on the coast. This ship had everything, had wonderful accommodation, had one of the best chefs you could get, excellent engine room crew, so they had a good chance. And they managed to get out to where the, the disabled freighter was before the weather turned. And they couldn't get a tow line on board because of the wind. They had several attempts to so fire rocket lines across the other ship and then use that to pull the, the bigger lines across. But the wind was too much for them. But eventually they did manage to get a line on it and they started towing. But the, uh, the weather was so bad they actually went through nine storms 
and it took them 40 days to get this, this ship back. They went through 60 and 70 foot swells out there and eventually they got it back to Vancouver and to a hero's welcome and it was an incredible achievement. I doubt if we could even do that these days, even with modern, modern vessels. But you can just imagine what that crew went through to do that and, and the risks. The tow line actually parted at one time, one point, and it had been attached to the anchor chain of the Macedonia. So the whole anchor chain was now dragging on the back of the Sudbury. And that's, uh, I think it's three tons of fathom. So they had 64 fathoms of chain hanging on the end of the tow line straight down into the, uh, into the ocean and it threatened to pull the, the stern of the Sudbury underwater. And the only way they could actually sort that out was to go at full speed so the tow line actually came up out of the water, it was no longer vertical, it was at an angle. And they were managed to winch it in very slowly until they could knock the pin out and lost all the chain. And then they had the problem of getting the tow line back onto the other ship again. If the line had got under the stern and gone round the prop, that would have been game over. And fortunately, uh, that didn't happen. But the only way it didn't was to keep the speed up on the ship, so the line was no longer vertical. But can you imagine, just on the back of a deck in a full storm, going up and down probably 30 feet at a time, trying to manhandle this three inch wire hawser, which is the main tow line, connected to this huge chain. And there's a shackle in the middle that they have to bang out with a sledgehammer to free the chain, with this thing leaping all over the place. I have no idea why there weren't casualties. But surprisingly, nobody was hurt, which really is a testament to the skill and, of, and courage of the crew. But they managed to get the line back on, on the Macedonia and take it under tow again and, and got home. And I just take my hat off to them, you know, things like that just, just blow my mind. I can't imagine doing that today. And uh, yeah, the, the achievement should be really one of one for the history books. But it wasn't the only one. They also went on and made several other rescues with the Sudbury. Uh, this is a picture showing the workboat position on the main Sudbury tug. And as you can see, it's, it's got a little crane on the back there to lift it into the water. And it's just around where the, the funnel is on the, on the ship. And that was used for carrying lines to other, other ships. And so that was a very important part of its operation. The, uh, the way they do that generally is to take a light line first to the other ship and then they pull that on board and use that to pull increasingly heavier lines. Because the main tow lines are typically, you know, three or four inches in diameter, extremely heavy. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to find a way of gradually increasing the, you know, the, the ability to pull a bigger and bigger line. But it also would be used to take supplies or fuel or anything that was needed. But the, uh, the amazing thing is that uh, they were able to do things like that, which even today we would be hard pressed to achieve. And sadly, the large ship has been cut up for scrap. And all we have left is the little workboat. But it's nice to be able to use that to continue the history of its, its mothership and to educate people with you know, what this was able to do. And I hope in the future we'll be able to use this little boat to take people out in the same way we do the other tour boats, and I'll only be able to take a couple of people at a time. But it means that we'd be able to go out in a piece of history around the harbour. And that's one of the main things that we want to do here, is to introduce people to boating who may not be that familiar with it, 
but also continue to keep the history alive. And that is very important to myself and a lot of the other people here that we don't forget the achievements of these people and also the skills that they had. The, the engineering skill and design skills were, were unbelievable. And just creating a boat like that, very, most of this is, is hand work and it's done by eye to a great extent. And if you look at the frames on the Sudbury, you'll find that both sides aren't quite the same. The spacing of the ribs isn't perfect, but it's, it's, it's an organic piece of creativity, which is as much, as far as, far as I'm concerned, as much art as, as engineering. And I just love the lines on, on the boats like these, which just look right. It's not that I don't like modern boats, but they don't seem to have the same inherent character as the old wooden vessels. And they all have a personality all of their own too. Once <laughs> you get to like them and understand them, then, you know, they become a friend. Looking good. Mark! Oh, oh, oh. I'm showered this morning. Oh, Thank you for coming, Tim. You guys have done a great job.